Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jason. I'm one of the leaders here at Christchurch Ferrum, but it's fantastic to be gathering together this morning. Uh, a warm welcome, whether it's your hundredth time or whether it's your first. Um, and particularly if you're joining us online as well. Um, it's great to have you with us. Um, we're going to encounter the presence of God this morning, which is amazing. Uh, I'm really expectant um, that we, as we gather, as we sing, uh, as we hear from Duncan um, preach the word, that we're going to really hear from God. Um, and I want to challenge us all today to not just um, consume, not just to sit there and think that actually it's the people at the front that are going to um, hear from God alone. Um, there's lots in the Bible about all of us um, have gifts and God can give us all words of encouragement and challenge. Um, so please feel free during the service um, to, to pray out a prayer, um, to read a bit of scripture, to encourage us, to lift our eyes towards God. Um, and it's going to be really a really exciting time. Um, after two songs, the kids are going to go out um, with Karen and Do. I know they've got a really exciting kids' work plan this morning. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to pray for us and then I'm going to hand over to Temi and the band to lead us in worship. Father God, I just thank you so much um, for the blessing that it is to be able to come before you this morning. The fact that a God so holy, so magnificent, so majestic would want anything to do with, with me and us is just truly breathtaking. And I just thank you so much. And I pray that in our worship time this morning, we would feel your presence. We would have prayers of rejoicing, prayers of uh, worship, and, and so much more. Just bless our time as we come before you now, I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Let's stand. Energy. Come on, people. <laughs> it's such a privilege we have to be able to gather together as a church and sing to our Saviour. So let's enjoy it this morning. Um, in John chapter 1, Jesus is described as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And in Revelation, Jesus is described as the Lion of Judah. What contrast between the 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 lamb, the gentle lamb of God who takes away our sins, but God who is powerful, majestic, a mighty king. We have boldness to approach this king today, exactly as we are. So let's open our mouths and sing. Let's be joyful to be in his presence. Let's sing Lion and the Lamb.
Father God, we thank you because you are awesome in power. If God is for us, who can be against us? We thank you, Father. Wonderful King Jesus you are. The kids are going to go out now to their kids' work. Enjoy. We're going to carry on worshipping. We're going to sing, I stand amazed in the presence. Lord God, you are magnificent, you are wonderful, you are awesome in power, the lion who triumphs, the lion who reigns, and yet you are also our saviour, the lamb who was slain on the cross for our sins, the, one, the lamb who loved us, the lamb who rescued us, 
the lamb who shed his blood in our place that we might be forgiven and free. Lord, we love you. We want to sing of your wonderful love. We want to declare your greatness. We want to stand amazed in your presence this morning, Lord God, for who you are and what you've done. We want to bow the knee before you, declaring that all power and all might belong to you. Lord, we love you, we glorify you, and we worship you together. But we say, pour out your Holy Spirit, Lord God, in greater measure upon us, that we might know your presence, know your love, and be filled with the joy of the Lord in this place, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. going to come into a time of communion in a moment, but just before we do, just felt as we were worshipping 
I felt God prompt me um, and remind me of something to just encourage us all today, that he's a God who has always dwelt with his people. You might be feeling that God is distant from you today, but I'm reminded of how God the Father dwelt with Adam in the garden and how they walked and dwelled closely together. Jesus obviously was was on earth and, and dwelt with people as the Son of God, but also when he left, he gave us the Holy Spirit that dwells within all of us that have accepted Jesus into our lives. So I just wanted to encourage you today that our God is a God who is present, feel distant from you right now, but he's not. If you've accepted him into your life, then he does dwell inside of you. So be Please be encouraged by that today. We're going to come into a time of communion. Um, if you want to take uh, bread and wine, if you haven't got one yet, um, now's your opportunity. I'm going to make a dash for my bread. Communion is what believers do, what those accepted Jesus into their lives, what we do in remembrance of him. I'm just going to read some verses from Matthew 26. This is Jesus um, when he's taking communion with his disciples. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When we take communion now, we do one of two things that I want to focus on today. We remember the price that was paid remember the love that Jesus showed us by having his body broken on the cross but we also we look forward and we're hopeful this shouldn't just be a time of um, sort of sadness somber reflection because actually the focus in these verses is one of hope uh, one of a declaration as we take communion of what Jesus has done for us on the cross And as it mentioned, we look forward to when he will return again for us. So as you take your bread and wine now, just spend a a moment or two in prayer. You might want to have a a prayer of thanking Jesus for what he's done on the cross. You might want to have a prayer uh, or just a time of thinking about that wonderful day to come when he returns. But let's do it with rejoicing and thanksgiving as we look ahead. So just take a moment to to do that and then I'll let us know when we're moving on. Verse 30, reading on. So after they're taking communion, after singing a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. We're going to come back and we're going to sing. We're going to rejoice. We're going to declare and remember again what Jesus has done for us in a time of sung worship. Stand and sing. 
amazing.
What wonderful truth. If you want to take your seats. Thank you, Temi and the band. Slightly thrown off that I'm used to the screen being that side. Uh, so I keep looking. <laughs> um, there's only a few notices this week. Um, the first notice is we've got a commission event. So if you don't know, commission is the family of churches that we're part of. And there's uh, an online event tonight, which I think you can access through YouTube or Facebook. Um, and uh, Vinu Paul, who um, oversees the churches in India and the surrounding regions, is going to be speaking to us. And Guy Miller, who leads our family of churches, has said there's going to be a special announcement. Um, so I, I don't know what it is. Duncan doesn't, well, claiming he doesn't know what it is. Um, so be there to listen to it to find out what that is. Um, there is also a women's Bible study this evening. So a number of the women um, meet together uh, uh, on a Sunday evening. I don't know much about it because I'm not a female. Um, but if you want to approach my wife, uh, Temi, if you just wave Temi, um, you can find out more details about that from her. Fantastic. Um, the only other thing before I pray and hand over to Duncan was I just wanted to um, really um, invite you to, to stick around after the service for prayer. Um, I'm really filled with expectation and, and faith this morning for praying, praying for people and laying on of hands. So um, by all means, um, head through and get a coffee and um, enjoy some fellowship out there. But if you do have anything that you want prayer for, um, then please do stick around and, and I'm sure there'll be a few of us that will be I'm delighted to pray for you. So I'm just going to pray for Duncan before he comes up. Father God, I just thank you for Duncan. I thank you for the preparation and, and the time he puts into studying your word and, and being able to bring it to us in such a helpful, um, clear way. And I just pray that, that the power of the Holy Spirit um, would be speaking through Duncan this morning. I pray that you would take um, his words as eloquent as they are um, and you would elevate them um, to really uh, penetrate our hearts to challenge us, to encourage, encourage us um, on the topic that he's, he's speaking on this morning. So we just pray for your blessing on him in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to talk amongst yourselves for a few minutes, and Duncan will let us know when he's ready. Yeah. <laughs> um, just as we were worshipping, I just had a Casting crown song lyric in my mind, so I'll share it with you. Um, it might be a provocation or a challenge um, to someone. Um, so I, I, I need to sing it, but I don't want to sing it. Um, so um, the, lyric go, the lyric, the song's about surrender, and the line says, Will you trade... Um, your dreams for his dreams, God's dreams, or are you caught in the middle? And the, the lyrics about someone who is battling with, shall they surrender to God's will on, upon their life, or should they hold something back and kind of kind of waver in the min, in the middle, in a kind of lukewarm kind of way? So, I just want to encourage you. Our God is good. He is a great King. And when he asks us to surrender to him, it's because he loves us. And so I just encourage you, if you, if you are, am I going to surrender to God or am I caught in the middle? I'd encourage you, surrender to God. He loves you. He wants what's best for you. And perhaps maybe there's someone who God's been speaking to you in dreams. And I just encourage you to kind of listen to him and heed that if that's you. I'm going to pray again and then I'm going to preach from the word of God. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and we thank you for your love. 
and we thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray during this moment now, you would speak. Would you challenge, would you shape, would you transform us as a church so that we bring you greater glory and greater worship? May we bring you the honour that you are worthy of, for you are an awesome God. You're powerful and mighty and loving and kind. You are the creator God. You are the eternal God. You are the God who is inviting us, your children, into eternity, into paradise with you, Lord. There is so much that is worthy of praise. You are awesome. We love you. And I pray that during this moment, you would be glorified as I preach. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just going to move this. So, uh, two weeks ago, you might remember last week we had Tim Blaber with us. It was great to have him with us. But two weeks ago, I preached from Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, the day the church was born. The Holy Spirit was poured out upon the apostles, upon the disciples. There were tongues of fire on their heads and a sound like a great rushing wind. And the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit. And Peter, the apostle, stood up before a great crowd of people and preached the gospel. And 3,000 souls were saved. 3,000 people believed in the good news, gave their lives to Christ and entered into faith, entered into the church. The question that we're gonna talk about this morning is this, what happens next? 3,000 people are saved, there's a church of 3,000 people. What was the church like in those early days? What did the church do after the day of Pentecost? And that is a very, very important question. And the reason it's an important question is because our goal is not to be a hip and trendy church rewriting the rule book, doing things differently than they've been done before. No, our goal is to be devoted disciples of Jesus Christ, just like they were 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem in the book of Acts. We're not, trying, we're not trying to rewrite the rule book. We're trying to follow Jesus and the instructions that he gave to his disciples. We want to follow those instructions as well. So when we're asking, what was the church like in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago? What we're actually asking is, what, do we, what shall we be like as the church? What shall we be like as Christians today in 2021? So as I read to you Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I like these people described in these verses? Is this church like what is described in these verses? Because that is the challenge and encouragement to us this morning. That we, th- This is the kind of church that we want to be at Christ Church Fairham. So let me read to you Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, and the words should appear on the screen. It won't. Okay, the words won't appear on the screen, so you just have to listen uh, very carefully. Acts chapter 2, if you've got a Bible, you can obviously follow along in your own Bible, but Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The same things that the church was devoted to in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago are the same things that we must be devoted to as Christians in 2021. And I believe this morning that some of us are going to be challenged. Some of us are going to be shaken. Some of us need to be broken out of complacency and laziness. Because I'm going to ask us this morning, are we going to live with the devotion of these disciples described in Acts chapter 2. Are you going to live with the devotion 
of a disciple of Jesus Christ. Are you going to join with us? To, we're going to do this together. This is, this is a challenge for us to receive together. This is a journey and an adventure for us to go on together. Are you going to join with us to live as a devoted disciple of Jesus Christ? Now you might notice in those verses that in verse 46 and in verse 47, um, the writer of Acts, a man called Luke, uses the phrase day by day. In other words, this devotion that the apostles and the disciples and the believers were showing in Acts chapter 2 was not a devotion on a Sunday and then apathy on a Monday. No, it was day by day, every day devotion, every day commitment to these things described in this chapter. So there are four things that the, uh, the believers were devoted to in verse 42. And we're going to look at those four things um, that they were devoted to. So, for, oh, there we go. We've got it on the screen. Beautiful. Thanks, guys. Um, so what four things were the believers devoted to in Acts chapter 2? Firstly, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. The people would gather daily. They would gather daily in the temple together, and they would also gather in each other's homes. And when they gathered, whether they were in the temple or in people's homes, the apostles would stand in the community, in the fellowship, and teach. Now remember, at this point in time, the New Testament hadn't been written down yet. It was the, it was the start of the church. The apostles hadn't written down their Gospels. And, and Paul, Paul wasn't even a Christian at this point. In fact, he was probably persecuting and killing Christians. So he hadn't written, written his letters yet. So they didn't have the New Testament. And so what would happen when they gathered was the apostles would stand up and they would teach. And some of that teaching would be from the Old Testament scriptures. Do you remember Peter's sermon? He quoted often from the Old Testament over and over again. And he was explaining what the Old Testament meant in the Old Testament scriptures. So some of the apostles' teaching would be from the Old Testament. But a great deal of the apostles' teaching would have been focused on the life, death, resurrection, the teaching and the miracles of Jesus Christ. And they would also, the apostles' teaching would also be focused on the gospel of grace, forgiveness and eternal life for all who repent and believe in Jesus Christ. I would have loved to have been there to hear this amazing teaching. Peter standing up and saying, I saw Jesus die on the cross. And then I saw him risen from the grave. Thomas standing up and saying, I put my hands in, his, in, the, hole, in the holes in his wrist. I was there. I saw him raised from the grave. And do you know why he was raised from the grave? To show that he has authority over death so that all who believe in him might have eternal life and live forever. It would have been amazing to hear this apostle's teaching that the people were devoted to. They were devoted to it. They loved to gather and to listen to this teaching. Do you know when we gather on a Sunday and we preach from the Bible, the reason we preach from the Bible is so that we're not devoted to Duncan's teaching or Dio's teaching or Jason's teaching or Jeff's teaching. No, we're devoted to the apostles' teaching which was written down for us in the Bible. The New Testament is the summary of the apostles' teaching. And this is why we're so keen to always preach from the word because we want to be devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the eyewitnesses of Jesus' life, death and resurrection from the dead. And so I want to ask you, are you devoted to the apostles' teaching? Are you excited to come on a Sunday and hear the Bible preached and proclaimed? That's one way to be devoted, to say Sundays is set aside for me to go and be with the Lord's people and to hear the apostles' teaching read from the Bible and to learn from God's word. So are you devoted in that sense to the apostles' teaching? You love to come on a Sunday and hear the word preached. But of course, to be devoted to the apostles' teaching today is not just to come on a Sunday Rather, it's to be reading the Bible, studying the Bible, learning from the Bible, submitting to the God's teaching, the apostles' teaching, over and over and over again. It's not just five minutes, quickly get it out of the way, you know, done, cast my Bible aside now, I've done my quiet time, I've done my devotional. That's not really devotion, is it, if it's just five minutes of really quickly scanning the text? No, 
We need to be understanding the apostles' teaching. We need to be questioning that, that what's, what's there. What does this mean? How does this apply to my life? How, how do I submit to this? How do I live this out? And we need to be praying over the word. Bible reading and prayer are very close friends. If you read the Bible without prayer, then I don't know, I'm not sure you do. Like it's a relationship with God when you read the Bible. So get your Bible open, pray that God would speak to you, read it, and then say, oh, I'm not doing this, or I could get, I could get better at that. I'm going to pray that in. Or if you're reading the, the, one of the Gospels and just seeing the life of Jesus, and you, you, you go to prayer and you say, oh, Jesus, I just love you. I thank you for this amazing miracle that I've just read. Or thank you for your death on the cross. Thank you for your resurrection. Prayer and Bible reading go hand in hand. And, and this is what it is to be devoted to the apostles' teaching, like the early church were. It is to come on a Sunday, in the gathered congregation to hear the word preached but it's also to day by day get into the word loving it being devoted to it some of us are more devoted to a tv program or tv programs in general than we are devoted to the apostles teaching through the word of god but we want to be devoted disciples who love to read the Bible because when we read the Bible, we hear the voice of God. We're told in the Bible that the author of the Bible is the Holy Spirit. Yes, human hands wrote it and there's in one sense a human author of each different book of the Bible, but over it all, God was king and his Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is the author of the Bible. And so when we read these words, we are hearing the voice of God spoken to us. Are you devoted to the apostles' teaching? Are you devoted to reading and studying and hearing the word of God preached? Now, the second thing that the early church were devoted to, according to Acts 2, verse 42, is fellowship. The devoted disciples in Acts chapter 2 loved meeting together. They loved being with each other. Verse 46 says, day by day they were attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. Now, we don't meet every day as a church, although if we had 3,000 uh, people who'd come to faith yesterday and we had 12 apostles who were sharing in the leadership of the church, perhaps we would be able to put on meetings every single day. If we did do that, there wouldn't be an expectation that you would necessarily come every day, but there would be this opportunity to gather and be devoted to fellowship day by day. Uh, although we don't meet every day, we do seek to mirror this model of fellowship that the believers were living out in the early church. We have Sundays, kind of the equivalent of gathering all together in the temple. The, the disciples went to the temple to gather and to hear the apostles' teaching. And so we have Sundays, which is kind of the equivalent of that. And then we have life groups, which is about fellowshipping and gathering together in one another's homes and eating together on some occasions. So we kind of mirror this fellowship that they're exemplifying to us in Acts chapter 2. They gathered in the temple and they gathered in one another's homes. We gather on a Sunday and we gather in one and others' homes in life groups during the week. Now, when you are devoted to something, you make sacrifices to prioritise it. Thinking about an Olympian, think about an Olympian, whatever sport, you pick your favourite Olympic sport and think about the athletes who competed in that event. They devoted themselves to being the very best they could be at that particular sport. And they made sacrifices in order to be devoted to that. So you think about, you know, the runners. They have certain diets. They eat certain things. And they don't eat other things. They, they, they refuse to eat certain things because they know that have a negative effect on their body. And they want to be the best. They're devoted. They're making sacrifices in order to be the very best Olympian that they can be. And so I want to I ask you, can you say, I am someone devoted to fellowship with my brothers and sisters. In fact, I'm prepared to give other things up in order to be devoted to the fellowship, devoted to relationship with the people in the church. If that's you, that means missing a Sunday is rare for you. And it hurts when you do miss those moments. Someone who's devoted to fellowship will want to be with the Lord's people and it will be rare and it will hurt when you don't get to get, gather with the Lord's people 
I'm not saying you need to be here every week, but you need to go, am I truly devoted to gathering? Am I yeah, devoted to fellowship like the people were in Acts chapter 2? Now you'll notice that it wasn't, fellowship wasn't just about gathering together for the disciples in Acts chapter 2. No, it wasn't just that they gathered, it was also that they were generous to one another. They cared for each other. They were selling their possessions. They were, they were sharing their possessions so that there was no one who had any need within the congregation of the church. That was part of fellowship. It wasn't just gathering together, it was also caring. And if you think about the day of Pentecost, what happens at the day of Pentecost is that many people are in Jerusalem from lots of different nations. And so there will be people who have come to Jerusalem um, to celebrate one of the feasts in the city of Jerusalem. They've heard the gospel at the, uh, when Peter has preached it and they've decided to stay in Jerusalem. It says all the believers were together. They've decided to stay in Jerusalem to continue to receive from this teaching, to continue to grow in the knowledge of Christianity. So we're amongst the 3,000 Christians in Jerusalem, there are lots of needy people. There are people who don't have homes. There are people who probably have only brought enough money for like a week in Jerusalem and they're staying there because they want to be devoted to this new body, this new group of believers. And so what the church does is says, well, we need to look after all these, all these people who believe in Christ. They're our brothers and sisters. We need to care for them. We need to gather with them. We need to care. So they would sell their possessions. They would sell their land, give to the church and make sure that there was no needs within the church. And so it's not just a being devoted to gathering together, it's also being devoted to genuine relationship with one another. Praying for each other when people have needs and even putting your hand in your pocket and giving to someone who is in need. That's the kind of fellowship we want to be devoted to in Christ Church Fairham. We want people to come into this church and go, hey, everyone has everything they need in Christ Church Fairham. And we go, yeah, that's because we care for each other. Some of us are richer than others, but the people who are richer give to those who have need when they do. And I do pray and hope that over time as we grow, more and more needy people would come into this church and we would be able to care for them and love them and have fellowship with them. Show them the love of Christ by our generous hearts. So are you devoted to fellowship? There are football fans more devoted to supporting their team each week, supporting players with whom they have no personal relationship. All they do is shout their name at the top of their voice. There are some football fans who are more devoted to supporting their team than some of us are devoted to supporting each other in fellowship in this church. But we want to be dis devoted disciples who love to gather together because we know that where two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, there God is in our midst. He is with us. Where two or three people are gathered in Jesus' name, he is with us. Jesus is with us. And that's why we love, that's one of the reasons we love fellowship is because God meets us in fellowship. Thirdly, what are the believers devoted to in verse 42? They're devoted to the breaking of bread. The, dis the devoted disciples love to eat together and they love to break bread, which is a reference to communion. That the Christians would come round, have dinner with me, and before we have dinner, let's, let's break bread. Let's remember the death of Jesus Christ upon the cross. They broke bread and they shared wine in remembrance of Jesus Christ giving his body and shedding his blood for us upon the cross. They remember that Jesus died. They remember that he was buried. They remember that on the third day he rose again in glory. And they were devoted to this practice of communion. There's a reason that we share communion every week in this church. It's because we want to be devoted to that way of remembering what Jesus has done for us. You know, there's lots of ways we meet with God and there's lots of ways we learn when we gather as a people. We sing songs and some people love singing and other people singing's not really their boat. They still join in, but it's, it's less, it's, they enjoy it less than others. We, we preach the word and some people just are so hungry for preaching for the word. They, they go home on a Sunday afternoon and they look up other sermons from other preachers because they just love receiving great teaching. And other people find it harder to listen to a sermon. And so another way in which we encounter God in our services is a very tactile way, a very a, a moving way, I think, of encountering God. A more, perhaps a more, more active and physical way of encountering God. We eat bread in memory that Jesus gave his body 
and we drink juice, or, or we use juice rather than wine, but we drink juice in memory that Jesus shed his blood. A very, a very yeah, tactile, very physical way of, of encountering God. And what we believe is that those who eat and drink in a worthy manner, by which we mean someone who receives those things by faith. Someone comes to the table with faith in Jesus and they, they eat the bread and they drink the wine with faith in Christ and what he has done upon the cross. If you receive from the Lord's table in a manner worthy, then you will be spiritually nourished in that moment with the benefits of Jesus' death once again being brought to you, being confronted with what Jesus has done for you. That's spiritual nourishment. And you will grow in grace. You know, part of the communion moment is to remember that we've done things wrong, that we've sinned, that we needed forgiveness, that Jesus needed to die for us. And so we, we come, perhaps we come to the table with a humility and almost, perhaps almost a sorrow where, oh, I've, I've messed up, I've done, done things wrong. And then we receive, and we receive with joy because Christ died for us so that we might be forgiven. Christ did not remain in the grave, grave, he rose again in glory. And so there's this mixture of sorrow and joy when we come to the table. There's spiritual nourishment and there's a growth in grace as we receive and meet with God in this way. I want to ask you, are you devoted to breaking bread? Do you love this moment of encountering God in our services? And also I'd encourage you do, you, do you love to get people around your house to have dinner with them? Or do you love going around to other people's houses for them to cook you dinner? Um, depends on whether you love to cook or not. There are some people who are more devoted to fast food than they are devoted and love receiving from God in the Lord's Supper. We want to be devoted disciples who love to break bread. Fourthly, what are the believers devoted to? They are devoted to the prayers in verse 42. It actually doesn't say in the Greek that they are devoted to prayer in general. It says the prayers, which is quite an odd phraseology. They are devoted to the the prayers. And what that means is, as believers, they were devoted to specific moments when the church would gather to pray. The prayers is, is like the prayer meetings. They were devoted to the prayer meetings. And now is a good time to mention that on the 5th of October, Tuesday the 5th of October, we have a prayer meeting. We're doing it once a month on the first Tuesday of every month. We're gathering together. I would love you, like the early church, to be devoted to the prayers by coming to those moments when we pray together. Of course, prayer is part of our Sundays. Prayer is part of our life groups and we have this monthly routine of gathering specifically just to lift situations up to God, to praise him, to worship him, yes, but to just say we need to pray for this, we need to pray for this person, we need to pray for this thing, we need to pray for God to move mightily and bring revival and save our town and do amazing things. We, want, we devote that time to prayer and I want us as church to be devoted to those moments because we want to be like the early church and we want to be devoted like them. I'm challenged by Christianity in other countries. Do you know in in Africa, there is a tradition of all-night prayer meetings in Africa. And it's not just one or two churches, it's lots of churches in this continent. I'm I'm sure it's specific countries where it's particularly a practice, but they'll gather and they'll spend all night praying and worshipping before God. Can we really say that we are devoted to prayer Can we really call ourselves devoted to the prayers when there are brothers and sisters around the world who are putting us to shame in terms of their devotion to prayer? Devoted disciples love to pray because they love speaking with their Father in heaven. And they love to pray not only in secret and in private by themselves, but they also love to pray with other believers. I love praying with other people. They encourage me. They pray for different things than I pray for. And they, can, they remind me that I should be praying for some of the things that I've forgotten to pray about. And then they pray for me and they encourage me. And so I love hearing the prayers of lots of believers coming together, all praying, all bringing different things. Short prayers, long prayers, you know, deep theological prayers, just simple prayers. To be honest, often I love the simple prayers more than I love the deep theological prayers. So I apologise when I use long words in my prayers. But I, I love just simple prayers because it encourages me and it builds me up and I think yes I'm with you amen I agree I'm with you in that prayer we're both asking God the Father for the same thing are you devoted privately and corporately to praying to God four things in verse 42 
that the believers were devoted to. The apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Now the question is, why these things? Why are these the four things that they devoted themselves to? After the day of Pentecost and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, why did they decide to devote themselves to these four things? (laughs) It's not legalism. They weren't devoted to these things because they thought, if we do these things, God will love us more. That's not what they were thinking in the slightest. These were people who had seen and experienced the love of Jesus Christ firsthand. They'd seen him die for them. They knew that God had loved them with an everlasting love and with a love that was deeper than any love that had ever been shown upon the cross. So it was not legalism. They did not do these things in order to earn more of God's love. No, they knew that God had loved them with this awesome, amazing love. It was not legalism. But I think there are three reasons why they devoted themselves to these four things. And the first one, I think, is the most important. These four things are the means God has appointed for us to meet with him. These four things are the means God has appointed for us to meet with him. I want to tell you about my best man. He's a guy called Alex. He's a cool guy. Um, He's way cooler than me. And he's been my best friend for many years. I've known him for a long time. But he lives in Watford. And to be honest, neither of us are very good at picking up the phone and chatting. And so in in living a, a, a longer way apart, we haven't spent that much time together. So we decided a couple of years ago that we are going to create a way to make sure that we always meet up and spend time together. And so we said that every year we're going to watch the Super Bowl together. That's that's going to be our thing. Like We're going to stay up late. To be honest, I don't even like American football that much, really. I kind of like it, but we're going to meet and we're going to watch the Super Bowl. And the reason we're going to do that is because that will become the means by which we will ensure that our friendship doesn't die. Every year we've got something in the diet that means we're going to spend four hours watching some boring American sport together, eating not very healthy food, and just, hang, just hanging out. That's the, that is the means by which my relationship with Alex will be strengthened and continue for many, many years, hopefully until we die. Do you see, we've appointed means for our friendship. God wants to love us. God wants to be in relationship with us. God wants to strengthen us. He wants to guide us like a shepherd guides his sheep. And he has appointed means by which we would meet with him, by which he would put love into our hearts, by which he would pour out his Holy Spirit. And these four things are the means that God has appointed for the church and for Christians to meet with him. In the apostles' teaching in the word, When we read the Bible, we meet with God. It's not just words on a page. It's God's voice spoken to us. And if we read full of the Holy Spirit, these things start to change us and shape us. And and so we meet with God in the word and in the preaching. I hope some of you at some point have sat in a sermon and gone, wow, I'm meeting with God. The, The preacher's saying something. I'm not really listening to him, but God is speaking to me through what he's saying. It's a moment of encounter with God. And I hope you felt the same when you've read the Bible at some point. You've been reading the Bible and gone, wow, God is speaking to me. The word of God, the apostles' teaching is one of the means that God has appointed for you to meet with him and for him to show you his love and his power and his glory. And so if you aren't devoted to it, then you are missing one of the ways that God has appointed for him to love you more do you see in the fellowship in the gathering of believers God has appointed that to be a moment where we meet with God have you experienced that we all together singing and God meets with us it's it's a blessing to gather with the fellowship because God wants to meet with us in that moment it's the same with communion when you take the bread and you drink the little cup it's a moment of meeting with God in 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 taking communion it's a spit it's a moment of spiritually receiving from God And the same with prayer. Perhaps prayer is the most obvious means by which we strengthen our relationship with God. We speak to him and he speaks to us. And so it's obvious. All these things are gifts. All these things are means of God blessing us and God meeting with us and our relationship being strengthened. So why were the believers devoted to these four things in Acts chapter 2? It's because they love God. They love him. 
They love him as father, the creator, the awesome power who, who gave all things, who created all things. They love father, their father in heaven. They love Jesus Christ, the son who gave his life upon the cross. The one who, for them, he, they saw him in the flesh walking on the earth. They love him and they love the Holy Spirit. He who comes and meets with us is God, is God here with us in the midst. They love God. That's why they're devoted to these things. They're devoted to the word. They're devoted to breaking bread. They're devoted to fellowship and they're devoted to the prayers because they love God and they want to meet with him in any possible way they can. And so they say, I'm going to be devoted to those things. That's the first reason and probably the most important reason they're devoted to these things. The second reason they are devoted to these things is in verse 43. Because in being devoted to these things, they saw God move miraculously. They saw signs and wonders, healings and miracles. And do you remember two weeks ago, we said we can't manufacture these amazing spiritual moments. We, we can't click our fingers and say, like, Holy Spirit, come, and God just does whatever we tell him to. And so we, we can't, we, I'd love it if we could, actually, you know, on a Sunday morning, we gather, and I'd get up the front, and I'd go, right, I'm just going to click my fingers, and we're all going to just fall on the floor as we experience the Holy Spirit in power. We can't manufacture, because it's a sovereign move of God. He decides when to pour out his Holy Spirit. It's the same with these healings and signs and wonders and miracles. Healing belongs to God. He is the great healer. Miracles belong to God. So we can't manufacture these things. But when we commit ourselves to these things, we leave more space for God to move miraculously and powerfully. If you are devoted to prayer, you are way more likely to see healing because you're praying for healing and you're asking God to move and God pours out his Holy Spirit and does miracles. So the second reason why the believers were devoted to these things is because as they were doing these things, God was moving miraculously and signs and wonders were happening. Thirdly, then, the third reason why they were devoted to these things is in verse 47. In being devoted to these things, God added to their number. Day by day, new people were believing in Christ and entering the church. In their devotion, God was on the move. Now again, we can't manufacture salvation. Salvation belongs to God. It is him who saves. But it makes sense to me that God would save often when we're trusting him, when we're devoting ourselves to the things that God wants us to devote ourselves to, when we're preaching the apostles' teaching, when we're praying for people to get saved, when we're, when we're loving each other in fellowship and we're eating together, when we're devoted to those things, it makes sense that God would move and begin to save people and bring them into the kingdom. So we can't manufacture salvation, but what the believers were seeing is, hey, we're doing these things and people are getting saved. Let's keep doing these things. You know, at university, I had a, um, a philosophical clash with another Christian in the Christian Union, um, a good friend of mine. We both wanted to see people saved, but we had very different philosophies about how that might happen. And so my friend would often miss church and miss Christian Union meetings and they would say, oh, I'm meeting with my non-Christian friends. I'm hanging out with them and I'm sharing the gospel with them. I'm going on mission. Uh, and, and in going on mission, we're missing the gatherings of the church and gathering, um, yeah, not being devoted to the fellowship, essentially. And I, I had a different approach. My approach was that I had uh, non-Christian friends. I played hockey. I lived in a house with uh, one other Christian and three non-Christians. But when it came to church, when it came to Christian union, I would say to my friends, I can't do, I can't go to that. I can't do that thing because I've got church, or I'm going to the Saturday evening Christian Union meeting. You guys head on out into town. I can't come. I'm going to... And, you know, by the time I got to second or third year, people would start to say to me, how come you always want to do that and not this? Like, we love this. Why do you love that? And so people would genuinely come to ask me and say, can I come to Christian Union on the Saturday evening? Because you seem to really love it, and I want to know why you love it so much, so I'm going to come. And my housemate Rob got saved, essentially, because he said, you guys always go to that, and I go out drinking, and you seem, ha you seem to enjoy that more than I enjoy this, so I'm going to... And he came, and he heard the gospel, and then he said, I think I might come to church on the Sunday as well, because you seem to enjoy that as well. And so he heard the gospel, and slowly he starts to receive the truth of the good news of Christ, and then he reads John's gospel and gives his life to Christ. Now, so... 
I, I admired my friend. They were really good at like, building relationships and sharing the gospel. They were really good at that. But I, I think, in a sense, God used my devotion to the fellowship and to the teaching and to prayers and to the breaking of bread because I just said, those are my priorities in life. And I, and I had the joy of seeing my friend come to know Jesus Christ, which began with a, why do you always do that? I wanna, I'm interested in. So what I'd encourage you is be devoted to these things in Acts chapter 2 because I believe if we do that as a church, God will move. God will bring salvation. God will bring healings, miracles, and signs as we pray for those things. And more than, more than either of those things, things, the most important, God will meet with us. Because these are the means. These are, this is what God has appointed for us to meet with God. Don't you want to have a better relationship with God, a stronger relationship, a deeper relationship? Well, devote yourselves to the apostles' teaching, to the word of God. Devote yourselves to fellowship. Devote yourselves to the breaking of bread. And devote yourselves to the prayers. I don't preach this in a frustrated, judgmental way. I preach this in love and I'm preaching to myself as well. I really believe if we increase our devotion in these things, our relationship with God will be closer, more wonderful, and more life-giving than ever before. Because these are gifts that God has given to the church. Now, are you devoted to the apostles' teaching? Are you devoted to fellowship? Are you devoted to the breaking of bread? Are you devoted to the prayers? And I want to lead us in a response. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to invite us to confess that we haven't been devoted to some of these things. So I'm going to invite you to um, close your eyes. And if with me you want to say to God, I haven't been devoted enough to some of these things, perhaps one of these things in particular, I just encourage you. I mean, you don't have to do this. No one's checking. I'm, I'm going to keep my eyes closed as well. I'm not going to look around the room. But I just encourage you just to raise your hand and say, yeah, Lord, I'm going to confess that I haven't been as devoted to one or some of these things as I should have been. Let that action, let that response be a moment of confession before God. Lord, we confess that the early church are kind of outrunning us, Lord. We confess that we have not been devoted to these things as we should have been. We've not been devoted to the word of God. We've not been devoted to fellowship. We've not been devoted to the breaking of bread. We've not been devoted to the prayers. We've been devoted to other things more than we've been devoted to you. And we just confess that before you, Lord. We thank you that Jesus died on the cross for our sin, that we are forgiven, that you welcome us, that your love for us has not decreased because our devotion hasn't been where it should have been. But Lord, we now ask that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit, that we might live these things with a greater devotion, that we might truly be devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. If, you, if, you wanna, if, you, if that's your prayer, why don't you stretch out your hands as though receiving the Holy Spirit. You, you want to say, yes, Lord, I want this devotion of the early church, Lord. Holy Spirit, come, move in our midst, Lord God, we pray. We want, Lord, we want you to move in our lives. We want you to increase our love and devotion to you. Thank you, Lord. And finally, I'm just going to pray for us as a church. Lord, as your people in here in Fareham, we want to be devoted to these things. We want to see lives transformed, people coming into our midst, people being added to our number day by day. We want to see healings and signs and miracles and wonders, Lord. So we ask that you would do those things. But most of all, Lord, we want you. You are our Father. You are our Saviour. You are the... You're just so good. We love you so much, Lord. And we thank you that you've said, hey, these are the ways that you can meet with me. These are the ways that you can encounter me. And so, Lord, I say as a church, may we be devoted to these things, Lord. Please, Lord, this is the church that we want to build, a church devoted to the apostles' teaching, devoted to the word of God, devoted to fellowship, loving, hanging out with each other, caring for each other, making sure there are no needs in our midst, Lord God. Lord, we want to be devoted to the breaking of bread, that moment of communion where we meet with you gloriously through the bread and through the wine. And Lord, we want to be devoted to the prayers, Lord. I pray you'd make us a prayerful <coughs> church, Heavenly Father. Why? Because we love you. And you are so good. So we thank you, Lord, for this challenge. And I pray it wouldn't just be a moment of response now on a Sunday, but it, it would now be a life. It would now be the days and weeks and months ahead where we would live out devotion to these things, helped by the great helper, the Holy Spirit, who is with us always. Lord, we love you and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite the band up to um, sing one final song.
Um, so let's let's stand together and let's sing. so much for the gift of your word Lord that we've heard today we've been challenged we've been uh, called out Lord and our hearts are awakened Father I pray that you would use us Father would you help us to be people who are devoted to you Father devoted to teaching to fellowship to breaking of bread to the prayers Father that we might know more of you Father and seeing you and knowing more of you we love you more Father we are emboldened we are empowered to share the gospel so father would you use us that souls would be saved father we would see in this church father we would see numbers uh, increasing and souls being saved father would you use us for your glory what a wonderful what these wonderful gifts you give us lord that we might encounter and meet with you you are such a great and wonderful god amen let's sing how great is our god Great, how great is our God. 
is our God. We're going to draw the meeting to a close now. Um, so thanks for being with us today. Hope you've enjoyed the service, but we're, we're not done. We're going to continue our fellowship um, over tea and coffee um, as you head straight through um, and just follow the, the people that will frantically be trying to get the best of the cookies. Um, do want to remind people, if, if, if you can head out, if you, if you don't want to hang around, but I will be sticking around, I'm sure, with a few others um, because we would really love to pray for people. Um, so if you do have anything... Um, please please stick around and, and just come forward. Um, similarly, if you're watching online and, and you have any prayer requests, um, please do send them into um, the church email and um, we'll be able to, we'd love to pray for whatever it is that, that you have a, as a need at the moment. So yeah, enjoy the rest of your Sundays. Hope to catch you over a, a coffee and a biscuit. <laughs>